The message that God put on my heart today, along those lines, was well, was thinking about well, some of the songs. The next Sunday is our, our third Sunday, uh, where you get to pick the hymns. And there's some really good, uh, some really good hymns you guys pick every single third Sunday. But I was thinking about songs about Jesus. Which there's a lot of songs in the book about Jesus. But I was thinking specifically the story about Jesus. And there's literally one song on our page 119 that says, "Tell me the story of Jesus." That's the title. You know, write in my heart every word. You know? And he goes on to tell about many different aspects of who he was and what he did. It's all right there in the, in the body of the song. Tell me that story of Jesus. What a precious, precious song that is. There's also the one is, I love to tell the story. This is something that's on my heart sometimes. Gives. Has God ever put on your heart to speak? To someone, I mean, just someone that you don't actually know. I mean, I've been in different parts of some time and, and walking in different places, and just uh, sometimes in a grocery aisle, and the thought just comes to my mind you know, that I should say an encouraging word or say something spiritually motivated toward this person. <coughs> I don't mind telling you, that's not easy to do. Because we think, oh, well, they're going to tell me I'm stupid, or they're going to tell me to mind my own business. All these negative things about what they're going to tell me to do, or tell you to do. But, and we question, well, where, where's that thought even come from? But when you think about, I love to tell the story, the name of that one song, of Jesus and his glory, to tell the old, old story of the Savior's love. If someone doesn't know Christ as Savior, wherever we're at, if God's Spirit tells us to speak to them, we need to speak to them because there's a need there. If they know Christ as their Savior, and you speak to them, they would be happy that someone wanted to tell, share with them, the joys that they already know. And if it's of God, the Spirit will... God's Word never returns void. Our Bible tells us it never returns void. But what really happened in Calvary ties in with the message of these two songs. Tell me the story of Jesus, and I love to tell the story. As I read the scripture for you from Hebrews chapter 9, God had implemented in the Old Testament a sacrificial system. Remember, when people sinned, animals were killed and their blood was put on the altar, right? And those, that, that blood was a foreshadow. It was looking forward to the day when the imperfect sacrifice of those animals that had to be, a life had to be given and given and given and given. Multiple animal lives for the blood, their blood for our sins. But one day on a cross such as this behind me, a Savior died, and a Savior shed His blood, and His blood was, was the payment once and for all. And that's what this scripture says here, as, as the writer of Hebrews, many believe it to be the Apostle Paul, wrote to, to those folks there in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 9. The words of Jesus, He says, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, meaning the first sacrificial system with the lambs and goats and doves and all that. He takes that away so that he might establish the second, meaning the blood of Jesus Christ. By the which we are all sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. There's no other sacrifices that are necessary now that Jesus has died for our sins. He goes on to say in verse 11, And every priest at that time that stood in the temple ministering the, the offerings gave the sacrifices. But those sacrifices of animals could never really take away sin. But this man, God made flesh, after he was offered once, the sacrifice for our sins sat down at the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected for forever them that are saved. 
that song, and Laura plays it every now and then for us, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain, but he washed it what? White. Uh oh, there's that snow over again. <laughs> it just keeps creeping in. I want to show the importance of what really happened to Calvary. Sometimes we, when we miss it, we think, hey, if I was to take a poll here today of, of different things, and you think of, you think of a good Friday, and you think of Jesus hanging on the cross, and you think of Calvary. I mean, we might get several different things. Some would say, well, well there's a cross there. And others might say, well, there was nails there, and, and, and they nailed him to a tree. And others might say that, uh, that soldiers gambled for his robes, and that darkness covered the land. There was thunder and lightning, and even an earthquake. And others might say that they put a crown of thorns on his head. All these visualizations that we have of that event that we know was the crucifixion of Christ. And all of those would be correct. But there's one thing that happened behind the scene that we not, didn't understand that pertained as much back then and it pertains even more today. Is that when Jesus died on the cross, He judged something. He judged sin. He judged sin. And, and we need to understand today that, that, that America, we as a nation, we as a country, we as individuals need him today more than that. We're all forget you can't turn the television on anymore without seeing this political ad guy attacking that political ad. I mean, it's just a mess, you know. Nobody knows anything when you watch these commercials. Everybody's, it, it's just, it, it's all negative. It's all negative. And we know that our political system is not going to solve anything. There's only one person that can, and that's Jesus Christ. America has turned her heart back to God. And what happened there at Calvary when Jesus Christ judged sin applies to us today. We've got to turn our hearts back to Him. God established how important His sacrifice was. We can look back in the Garden of Eden in Genesis, what should God warn Adam and Eve? He says, of, every, of all of these trees in the garden, you can eat all of these except what? Except that one. The tree of knowledge of good and evil is what it was called. He said, you can't eat that one. Of course, we had a better idea, didn't we? Well, I like that one. That one looks good. Boy, that apple, that orange, that pear, that peach, whatever it was hanging on that tree. It just looked better than all the rest. And that's what the our adversary told us. And that's one thing you notice when you read that that account. And, uh, and just for a plug, too, after we're finishing, in Bible study, we're finishing up the book of Ephesians, uh, or chapters 5 and 6. And after that, we're going to be going back to Genesis. We're going to change this, the, the, uh, the format of the study just a little bit from verse by verse to a topical there will be a lot of scripture involved but in the topical study we're going back to Genesis we're going to start there in Genesis on the different themes creation uh, the flood the fall of man Abraham and on and so forth so if you'd like to be a part of that we'd love to have you be a part of that but no place in the Bible you find where Adam and Eve uh, came up with it, this thought that they wanted to eat of that tree in and of their own. All the way the adversary, the enemy, the devil suggested, he said, hey, check out this tree. It looks pretty good, doesn't it? I mean, God had already said, you know, don't eat of that. And there was no inkling on either one of their part to go anywhere near because God had said, don't. Don't eat it, don't touch it, uh, is stay away from it. He wanted them to obey. Many of us have done that with our kids uh, growing up over the years. We give them just enough rope to see if they're going to obey us when they have the choice to do right or wrong. And God gave us the choice. But it took just a little nudge from the devil, a little suggestion from the devil. 
one thing that I remember telling my kids growing up, you know, because uh, the older that they get, you see JD sitting here in the front row, you know, the older that they get sometimes they thought that, uh, you know, they could be out, that they could hang with certain crowds and then nothing would ever happen. I used to always tell my kids, nothing good happens at two in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, and when we laugh and we smile, we know because some of you probably been there. <laughs> but nothing good happens at two in the morning when you're out running around. And I drill that into them. But you know, we think we know better sometimes. And as to be given the proper prompting, and sometimes we can get in a group of people where we would make the choice if we were by ourselves. But when, if we're in that group, we can make the wrong choice. Satan says, hey, over here, check this out. I know what God said, but you've got to see this for yourself. This is good stuff right here. I mean, this top of line produce here. All we need sometimes is a little nudge. We've got to be aware of that. We've got to be aware of that. Another thing I caution my kids growing up is we don't want to see how close to the edge we can walk. So that if, if something does happen, if we slip or we trip or even if we fall, that we don't fall over the line that we didn't want to cross. I always encourage them. I say, put, some, put a buffer zone between you and that line that you're drawing in the sand. Put a buffer zone there so that if you trip, do trip, you do stumble, you do fall, that you've got room there to get up and, and go on. And go on. What really happened in Calvary had its roots there in the Garden of Eden when we decided we knew better than God. What really happened in Calvary is that the love of, of, of Jesus Christ there on the cross It just overwhelms me sometimes. And I got misty on it earlier, but it, it literally causes me to nearly cry sometimes when I think of what He, me, Jesus, has done for me. When I think of you know, everything in my life, when you think of everything in your life, well, what He's done for us. He paid for my sins. His blood paid for my sins. He judged sin there on the cross so that I don't have to spend an eternity there. That's a message that we, we've got to carry to the world, folks. It's a message that we've got to share with the world. It's a message that we've got to live every single day. Every single day. Not just as a church, but as individuals, as a people, with our family members. We've got to let them know that Jesus took care of sin there on the cross. When he was on the cross, you and I were on his mind. He wanted to pay for us. Oh, I've heard folks say, you know, this was from some of my Baptist, my Baptist background, a guy told me one time, he says, you know, you Baptists are, you're a bloody bunch. You preach a bloody gospel. I think the same thing should apply here for us as, as UCC. We need to preach a bloody gospel because God provided life through the blood. The Old Testament sacrifices look forward to the day when Jesus Christ, that perfect sacrifice, would pay for our sins. And folks say, well, why would God do it this way? You know, blood is so yucky, blood is so gory, and it's just so distasteful. Everything God does is to honor and glorify Himself to the utmost. And when God presents something in a way as He has the sacrificial system and blood is spilled to pay for sins, it should tell to us that picture that Christ has created, that God has created with the sacrificial system, how distasteful sin is to God. How many times, well, you know, my sin's not hurting anybody. Your sin, my sin, hurts God. It hurt him enough, but he paid for it anyway. He paid for it, and, and he wants us to understand that there's forgiveness for sins. So what really happened at Calvary was that sin was judged. 
A holy God communicated how much he hates sin because he wanted to pay for our sin. And there in John chapter 1, remember when Jesus was approaching John the Baptist. John's comment was there in verse 29 of John 1. He says, Behold, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. That's what was judged at Calvary. Sin. Jesus came to pay the, the price for us. Jesus was on the cross. He was that Lamb that was slain on the altar. But the significant difference is, as our scripture said today, He was offered one time. There's no other need for us to do any other sacrifices or altars or anything like that whether we're Jews or Gentiles. Because Jesus paid it all. One time, the book of Hebrews said, one time the writer of Hebrews said, he was offered and that was good enough. He's at the right hand of the Father right now making intercession for us, each one of us. And whatever we're going through, whatever trouble water we're going through, whether it's a physical illness, whether it's a spiritual we're grappling with something, decisions, choices, whatever heartache that we're going through, He's there with us. It could be for family, it could be for friends, it could just be for the world in general. But we really need to pray for those, those families. We're talking about the hurricane there that just hit Florida. And it caught everyone by surprise because it wasn't supposed to be quote unquote that thing. But just the pictures of just devastation. Hurricane Michael. We need to pray for those. Support the organizations that you know are worthy and are helping those folks. It's a crazy, crazy world. But our Savior wants to make a difference. He wants to be the sacrifice. For your sins. He is the only sacrifice. He willingly offered himself once for all. And that's good enough to satisfy God. If we'll but choose his free gift. Refusing to accept his gift, as we said time and time again, a gift is not a gift until it's received. Share it with our families, with our friends. Share it with our enemies so that they might become friends brothers in Christ, or sisters in Christ, members of our spiritual family. We've got a hope. Because of Calvary, He judged sin. And we can know the way, we can know the life. And when Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, no man, no woman, no boy, or girl comes to the Father, but by me. If you don't know Him today, see me afterwards. If you're not walking with him today, bend your knee and say, God, I'm sorry I haven't lived up to my part of the bargain being the best Christian I could be. I'm sorry that, that I've, I've let this in, or maybe it's, we all have little, uh, little pet sins I've heard of them fall in the past. God, I'm going to give this back. I'm going to do something about that. You walk right, you do your part, and God promises what we did. He'll do this. He'll honor you. He'll uplift you. He'll encourage you. And he'll guide you every step of the way. So what really happened in Calvary? Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. And he accepted his gift today. Amen? Amen. Amen.